Well, welcome everybody to Crossway's online service. My name is Stephen Fogg. I am the online campus pastor here at Crossway. And uh, an especially big welcome if it's your first time here today at our church service online here at Crossway. Um, wherever you're watching from, whether you're in Asia or South America or North America or Europe or the Middle East or Africa, wherever you're watching from, from any of those continents, you are always welcome to join us. Every single week we do these services multiple times on the weekends. I know a lot of people watch these services back. So even if you're watching this back, a big welcome to you for this service. Hey, we've got lots coming up in this service. Um, we are continuing our sermon series, uh, Living Among Lions. And Pastor Mark Purser is gonna be preaching the word to us today and we have James and the team leading us in worship. So be expecting of what God is going to do in your lives. I know he's got incredible plans for your life. Um, and for some of you, just you bursting at the seams, wanted to know what they are. But just be expectant. Open your hearts and minds to what God will say throughout this service. If it is your first time here this week, big welcome. Go dive into the chat and let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to know where you're watching from. So go ahead, if it's your first time, last, you know, you've been here a hundred times, go and welcome people uh, if they're in the chat there for the first time. Let's be a welcoming community online, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, or on our church website. I will be in the chat later on. I'd love to say hello to you as well. Let me pray for our service today. Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that no matter what is in front of us today, that you are there. No matter what challenge we're facing, no matter what circumstance we are facing today, you are bigger than that circumstance right in front of us. So I just pray that we'd be able to put that to one side right now, that we'd be able to focus on this service, open our hearts, open our minds to what you would have to say through this book of Daniel. What an incredible book. Uh, would you speak to us ever so clearly today? Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, again, doubly big welcome if it's your first time. Dive into the chat. I'm sure a couple of people are chatting in there right now. So go ahead and be brave and do that. One of the things we love for people to do every single week is to take a step. And the step that you could take is to step into authentic community here at Crossway Online. One of the ways that you can do that is by joining our online Facebook group. The team will pop a link into the chat where you can join that group. And I say hello to everybody on the inside as you are entering, I send you an email, I'll send you a Facebook message. So to be sure to watch out for that message because I love saying hello and getting to know you more. And one of the reasons why I want to get to know you more is to help you find your place in our community. Uh, and I speak to people all over the world and locally here in Melbourne as well. So um, we love to, to connect with you in that group. We also love for you to find a place in an online life group where you can go deeper with people uh, and, and share your faith and read the Bible together and pray together. Uh, so there's those opportunities that are there for you as well. Uh, every single week I say that the mission of God is in the hands of ordinary people like you and like me online. Uh, and one of the ways that you can sh share this service and live out that mission is by sharing the service literally. Uh, so if you're on Facebook, you can literally hit the share button. You can tag someone in the chat right now, invite them to watch with you, or you can send it to them via a message. If you're on YouTube, you can subscribe to our channel. You can share it. I know lots of people share our YouTube services. Even if you're watching this back, share it. Uh, you can send a WhatsApp message, Facebook message, a text message. Go ahead and share the service. You never know what God is gonna do with your step of faithfulness to your friendship network, to your family network, to your work network. Let's join the team now. Let's open our hearts and open our minds to what God is gonna say to us and let's worship the Lord our God.
as we enter your presence in your spirit we bow and wonder through the flashes of color all the voices proclaim forever holy 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 is the as we enter a time of communion 
Uh, if you haven't had a chance to receive the elements on the way in, uh, if you just raise your hand nice and high, uh, our team would love to come in and, um, and distribute the elements to you. We're a couple of weeks on from the Easter weekend. Uh, what a weekend of celebration we had here uh, and across all our campuses. And uh, at one of the Easter services that I was at, I, um, I kind of grabbed the elements on the way in, but throughout the service, something kind of happened. I think I was pulled away um, and I didn't end up taking the elements and I brought um, kind of my little pack home. And since Easter, it's been sitting just as you kind of enter our house, we have this basket. I don't know if you've got a basket like we do, but it's where the kind of keys and your wallet and foreign currency and name tags from some conference you attended. And it's just this kind of miscellaneous basket where as you walk in, you just kind of place stuff there and it's now out of sight, out of mind, and you'll get to it maybe someday, one day, far down the track. And as I was preparing for communion, uh, this week, I was, I was looking at those communion elements uh, in the basket in my house. And, and whilst it's probably true that many of you share the same physical basket uh, that I have inside my house, but we all have a bit of a spiritual basket like that as well, don't we? Uh, where maybe you've got a thought or a prompting or an image from the Lord and, and you see it and receive it and you're thinking about it, but something drags you away. And so you kind of just as life follows you on, place that thought into that spiritual basket, that kind of catch all, and you'll get back to it at some point. And uh, it's uh, really burdened me as I've prepared to just um, to, to be reminded about how, um, how wrong it is for the communion elements to sit in that basket. And, and as we come to this spiritually, uh, wherever you're at in this moment, as we come to the time of taking communion together, we're not joining in something that's just pushed aside in a basket, in some catch-all, just to be picked up at some point down the track. What we're entering into now is a time of real significance. It's a sacred time. It's an important time of remembrance as we, as we pause and think about the sacrifice of Jesus. And so just before we share in the elements together, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of time to reflect and perhaps pull those communion items out of that spiritual basket. Just pause and, and reflect on perhaps what else is in there that's creating space and clutter and a lack of clarity uh, and just pull those elements, the death and the resurrection of Jesus to the forefront of your mind. So we'll pause uh, and then I'll lead you as we take the elements together. on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Church, let's eat together. place and we fix our eyes on you, Lord God. And we say, thank you, Jesus, for your body broken for us. Lord God, undeserving sinners, but you would send your son for us, God. We say, thank you, Lord. 
for your blood poured out for us, for the forgiveness of sins, for the forgiveness of many. Lord God, we claim the blood over our lives, Lord, that you would be washing us clean in this moment. Lord God, we pray for each one of us here as we take communion together, Lord, that we experience the cleansing, the forgiveness, the freedom, the life that's in the blood. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as we continue to worship.
love you guys uh, and we pray that it's a blessed experience for you wherever you're joining us from. For those of you who are joining me in the room here, it's a blessing to be here with you today. My name is Nick, I'm part of the team here um, and, and what a joy it is to be here worshipping together. There are so many opportunities for us to continue worshipping throughout the week and engaging with uh, the mission that God has placed before us here at Crossway to see the city, nation and nations become disciples of Jesus. And uh, if you want any more information about what's happening in the life of the church, I invite you to scan the QR code on the screen in front of you. That will just take you to a page that will give you all the information that you need to know. There are a couple of opportunities that we have here uh, at Burwood East this week to come together in worship. And I just wanted to draw your attention uh, to those. So on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. in the chapel, we have our young adults together night. We're really, really looking forward to joining together uh, to hear a word about true worship. Uh, if you're kind of wondering how the young adults ministry or life in young adults works here, well, anywhere you look at Crossway, there are young adults that are serving and invested and connected in the life of the church here, helping out, serving at Crossway kids and youth and on the weekend services, anywhere you look. We're so blessed to have a movement of young adults who are pressing into what the Lord is doing. And a few times a year, uh, we get together as a community of young adults uh, in the chapel for what we call a Together Night. And that is happening this Tuesday at 7 p.m. So if you are young adult age, you can guess what age that kind of, no, nah, it's 18 to 30 year olds. And we'd love to help connect. You see 30, that's, uh, I don't know, when do you become it? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, we'd love to have you at our Together Night. It's such a good opportunity to join to join together um, and if you need any more information uh, you can head to that QR code our team will be here after the service we'd love to connect with you uh, and help you be a part of that on Tuesday night on Thursday at 10 a.m. we have our midweek worship service which is a bit more of our traditional worship service and we are so blessed and excited to be hearing from Pastor Stuart Robinson this Thursday at 10 a.m. for our midweek service. So contact your boss, organise Thursday morning off. Um, it's going to be a, um, a fantastic time of worship together on Thursday morning in the chapel. Um, and again, more information can be found on the QR codes uh, or with our team. But we invite you uh, and would love to have you there on Thursday to hear from Pastor Stuart. Uh, we acknowledge as a church the mission set before us doesn't just stop here, but it goes to the ends of the earth. And if you look around the world, uh, we see a world that's desperately in need of God, don't we? Uh, there's so much brokenness, so much hurt in the world. And as we enter a time of prayer, um, we're just going to be praying for um, some of those issues that are out there in the world at the moment. And I invite you to do the same uh, in your own time of prayer, to be uh, looking beyond home, uh, to believers and to people everywhere who, uh, who need an encounter with Jesus. And so we'll be praying um, for our world today. And um, shortly after that, we'll uh, bring our tithes and offerings. So uh, you'll notice that there's a container at the end of your aisle. Uh, after we pray, I just invite you to, um, to pass that container from the side toward the center of the aisle. Cheers, let's pray together. Lord God, we come before you and we acknowledge that everything was created by you and through you and in you, Lord. You see this world and you see a world that desperately needs a touch from heaven, Lord. And God, as we cast our eyes beyond our shores, Lord, we pray for those in Taiwan as they recover from a devastating earthquake for all those uh, that are injured, that those that have been displaced, those who have uh, lost their lives, Lord, and families that are now pressing in um, and, and looking for answers. Lord God, be present in Taiwan in this recovery effort, Lord, out of the rubble. Will you build your great work in that place, Lord God? We commit them to you, Lord. We pray for all the areas of our world that are experiencing <coughs> war and famine and, and brokenness for believers who are being persecuted for their beliefs, who can't who can't join together publicly and declare their faith. Lord God, we pray for our brothers and sisters across the world. Lord God, will you be their portion and their provider and their strength, Lord, for people who need you and are crying out to you in the depths of darkness. Lord God, meet them as they cry, Lord. <coughs> we acknowledge
acknowledge your hand of sovereignty over the earth, Lord. And we ask that you would come and meet us again by Holy Spirit in Melbourne, in Australia, and beyond to the ends of the earth, Lord. And Lord, as we bring our tithes and offerings before you today, Lord, I pray again that you would raise a spirit of gratitude and generosity up in this church into our hearts, Lord, that we would see purpose in responding to your goodness in this way, that we would invest into the work that you're doing through Crossway, Lord. And I pray for Pastor Dale and the board and the team here as they look to steward these um, these resources responsibly, Lord, as uh, they look to invest into your kingdom as you lead them, God. Give them a real sense of wisdom and discernment. Lord, we commit our tithes and offerings into your hands. And as we come to hear the word today, Lord, open our hearts and our ears. Lord, may we be a church that's ready to receive a new word from you today. So God, we fix our eyes and our hearts on you right now. In Jesus' name. I invite you now to um, grab the containers from the end of the aisle, pass them toward the centre and welcome Pastor Mark as he comes to share the word. Well, thank you for that very enthusiastic clap over there, whoever that was. It was very nice of you. Yeah, there it is again. Thank you. I'm not looking for a clap. Just wanted to single out that clap over there. It was a really good one. Uh, hey, uh, uh, good evening. It's great to have you all with us at Crossway, and good evening to those of you who are watching online. So good to have you with us wherever you are watching from. We're going to continue our Living Among the Lions series today as we track the life of Daniel. Although in today's narrative, Daniel is strangely silent. It's actually his three mates that we're going to put the spotlight on here. And here we find these three guys facing a huge, huge test of faith. The heat is very much on them. Will they wilt under pressure or will they courageously stand firm? Now, last week, Pastor Dale introduced us to Daniel and his three mates as we traveled through chapter one. And they had been exiled, you might remember, they had been exiled into Babylon, they'd been taken from their families, and they'd been training for palace duties for the best part of three years as 15-year-olds, and they graduated as 18-year-olds with those credentials. And they were given new names, all aligning to some Babylonian gods, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and now living in a context that would be dishonoring to their God in the heaven. And we see right from the get-go their dedication to their God in their refusal to defile themselves by partaking in King Nebuchadnezzar's delicacies. And the king finds in these guys no equal to them. He's so impressed by them, they make a huge, huge impression upon him. Now in chapter 2, we see that Daniel interprets the king's dream. And at that point in time, he comes into the king's favour. He's made ruler over the province of Babylon. And Daniel then has his three friends appointed as administrators over the province while Daniel himself remains in the royal court. And so we come to chapter 3, which is what we're going to look at tonight. And we see Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego collectively facing this massive, massive dilemma. One that would be a true test of their character. One that would be a true test of their love for God and their allegiance to God. Now, for those of us who love God, for those of us who follow Jesus, for those of us who use Scripture as a foundation for our moral and our lifestyle choices, you will know that life is full of testing dilemmas. Do I stand firm in my Christ-like convictions, or do I conveniently toss them aside and blend in with what the world is offering me at that point in time? That was my dilemma. As a graduating student back in the early 1990s, I just graduated with a Bachelor of Business and it was time to get a job. I'd been on a long holiday, I'd cut the mullet off and I was ready to go. I needed a job, I needed some income. And so my first job interview was actually at Kenworth Trucks. I didn't particularly like trucks, but it looked like a good job. So I went to Kenworth and I did well through the interview process and got down to the very last two. And I remember sitting there, it was the last interview and it was an aptitude test, it was a young girl next to me and the two of us are vying for the same position it appears that she was more apt than I was because I didn't get the job and so I was I was tossed out and I had to continue searching for a job it was a few weeks later I had another job interview it was with Telstra then Telecom 
Remember telecom? It was back in those days. And again, I got right through to the business end of the interviews. I was shortlisted down to the final two. I was sure I was going to get the job. It made a great impression. They were really impressed by me. They even said so. And I found out that the manager knew my family really well. And so he, he believed in our bloodline as well. I thought, this is my job. Well... I didn't get that one either, and I was uh, passed by. And so I was really frustrated and discouraged, and I came across his ad for an assistant manager in a news agency in my local area in the eastern suburbs, and I thought, oh, that looks interesting. I was interested in retail. Uh, it, was a, it was a good job. It was close by, had good hours, and it had a great wage. It was $25,000 per annum. Now, you might scoff at $25,000, but back in those days, they were the days where potato cakes cost 20 cents, not $1.50, where you could buy a two-bedroom new, brand-new unit for under $100,000. Can you believe that? So $25,000 would go a long, long way. Had the phone interview, and it was as good as done. I had the job. And I went in there, and uh, I, uh, just to familiarise myself with the news agency to see where I'd be working, and then, then it dawned on me all of a sudden. I would be the assistant manager of a news agency that was overtly promoting and selling pornographic magazines. And I, here I would be over-the-counter sales, taking money from people for those very magazines. Now, that didn't sit well with me. It didn't sit well in my spirit, and it conflicted with my moral values and my convictions around the sexual purity that God calls of us, his children. What do I do in that situation? I needed a job. I desperately needed money. It was close by, good hours, good income, all those sorts of things. Look, no one would know. And I'm not, I'm not reading the magazines. I'm just giving them to somebody else. But hey, all these counter arguments, the Holy Spirit was still convicting me in a major way. And I knew what I had to do to stay true to my convictions, to stay true to my faith and to my God. I had to turn that job down and remain unemployed. And trust that God would have a job for me down the road at some point. And he did. That's in fact exactly what happened. He had me covered and rewarded me, I think, rewarded me for my patience and my honouring of him. And a few weeks later, I ended up with a full-time job when a sales position became available in my family business due to a sudden illness to somebody in the family that they didn't see coming. But I wonder if you can think of a time in your life where you were faced with a dilemma, where your faith, where your were your Christian convictions and what was on offer was in conflict. Can you think of a time? There's plenty of them. Perhaps you can even relate to this because I've seen this happen many times in the church over the years. Perhaps you were single at some point in time, but you're looking for a relationship, really hankering for a long-term marriage relationship, wanting a soulmate in your life. And so you you went on on the prowl, on the search, and you found someone. You had a lot in common. There was chemistry. There was a spark. It was all good. There's only one problem, one hurdle. That person didn't love Jesus. See, that person didn't have any, any interest in the faith that you carried yourself. Happy for you to have your faith, but not so happy to explore it themselves. What do you do with that? Because you know in the Bible, God speaks about being equally yoked in marriage relationship. Do I just conveniently discard that, toss that aside, go ahead with the relationship, or do I honour God's heart for married relationships? It's a very real dilemma that many people in the church have faced. Or perhaps it's tax time. You might be able to relate to this. You sit down, and you do your taxes, and you think to yourself, you know, there might be a way I might, I might be able to squeeze another two or $300 out of the government here. I could just exaggerate my claims. No one's going to come knocking. No one's going to come looking for little old me. No one will know. And you, so you over-exaggerate. Well, the temptation is to over-exaggerate your claims. But then again, that sense of conviction. Do I do that? No one will know. Or do I stand by and stand Stay in step with God's word in his heart for all truth and all honesty. See, we're faced with these challenges, these challenging scenarios constantly, but dare I say, not on the same level as our three friends in question tonight. Look at what they're facing. So you've got King Nebuchadnezzar here. He makes an image of gold, and it's massive. It's 90 feet high, and it's nine feet wide. You couldn't miss it. There's no way you could miss it. And he then commands that all people of the whole nation... That whenever they hear the harp or the sound of a lyre or maybe a bell, whatever it might be, a horn, all kinds of music. Whenever you hear that type of music, you are to immediately fall down and worship that very statue of gold. And if you don't, 
big trouble, massive trouble. You'd be thrown into a hot, blazing furnace with absolutely no chance, no chance of survival. And then we find the king is absolutely furious because he's made aware that these three guys that he thought were his confidants, you know, under his employment, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were not serving his gods. They didn't want to have a bar of his gods. And there's no way they were going to bow down and worship this gold statue that he had made. So he summons them into his presence and threatens them and says, I'm going to throw you into the furnace if you don't change your ways here. You must bow down like everybody else. And he even infers that there'll be no way they'll be able to survive that furnace. No God will be able to help you. What a dilemma. What a massive dilemma these guys are facing. Do they fold? Do they bow down? Do they simply blend in with the culture of the day? No one would bat an eyelid if they did. No one would probably even know. They would just be joining in with what everyone else is doing. Will fear win the day? Or do they stick to their convictions and look to honour their God in their response? Have a look. Have a look here at their response. It is quite astonishing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Wow, what a response. What incredible courage. Now, last week, Pastor Dale highlighted Daniel's conviction. You might remember he talked about Daniel's convictions and his allegiance to God and, and then encourages, he fleshed that out in a practical way, in an applicable way to our lives. And he asked us, reminded us how important it is to, de- to develop our own convictions and to hold them graciously. Remember you said that? Well, I agree with that. But I want to go a step further tonight and suggest this, that There'll be times in our lives where, yes, we need to develop our Christ-like convictions and not just hold on to them graciously, but hold on to them courageously. There is a cost to discipleship that you can't avoid. And will we be willing to count that cost, to step out in obedience and to cop the heat that will come when you go against the grain? When you go against the worldly grain, you will cop some heat, make no mistake. And if you don't cop heat, you probably haven't gone against the grain. Standing by what you believe in, honouring God and being consistent with the biblical and the Christ-like values in your life, it will bring the heat. Make no mistake. And these guys, they literally put their bodies on the line. They are willing to die. They would rather die than compromise their faith. So four things at play here that I want to highlight that I trust is an encouragement to you and perhaps a challenge to you. And I made it very easy for you because they all start with a letter C. The first one is this. Conviction is very much at play here. So these guys, they know that there is only one and only true God that is worthy of their worship. That is based on a long-held belief that is firmly embedded in their hearts and their minds. And a conviction will always align with belief. Always. Now, if you don't really know what you believe, then your conviction will waver. It really will. And you'll give in to anything that appears enticing at the time. You'll you'll waver, you'll you'll sway like like, like a tree sways in the breeze. Well, you'll be swaying like you're in a hurricane because eventually you'll be uprooted because you're standing for nothing. These guys don't waver. They don't even flinch. Facing off with a furnace, with a faith that is unshakable and very much a conviction that is unbreakable. Picture yourself in their shoes. What would you do? Just put yourself in their shoes for a moment if you can. The impending flames that would be licking all around of them. The king's decree that is quite clear and quite prominent that you can't miss. Death, certain death awaits. What would you do? I wonder how many of us would play it safe. I think most people probably would play it safe. I would understand people taking the safe option, yet the safe option is not always the best option, certainly not in God's eyes. We don't need to defend ourselves, they go on to say. We don't need to defend ourselves. That is courageous conviction right there. Now, in our Aussie context, the context that we live in here in Australia, 
This test, these tests of conviction, Christ-like conviction, in many ways is quite soft compared to so many Christians around the world who are being persecuted for their faith, for those who are, who are, who are underground worshipping God, for those who are seen to worship our great God, for those who even utter the name of Jesus. For us, for them it's a matter of life or death, literally. For us here in Australia, often our test of obedience that will set us apart from societal norms will simply have us mocked or ridiculed or perhaps excluded or isolated. At best, that's our cost. But will we be willing to even count that cost for the sake of our Lord? Second one is compromise. These guys are facing off with compromise in a major, major way. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they could easily have compromised their faith and simply blended in and continued on without a fuss. And I can think of the excuses, no doubt, were going through their minds that they could easily have come up with. After all, hey, we, look, we could fall down and worship this huge, big golden statue, but not really worship it. We could just pretend we're worshipping, but God would know what we're doing. We could do that. Or, or we, we, we could fall in line. And God will just forgive us because God knows our heart and he'll forgive us for, for the error of our ways. Or Look, the king is the king and so we ought to obey his commands and we're part of this foreign country now and this foreign country has foreign customs and perhaps we should play ball and just fall in line with that. And, and, and hey, look, we're needed in our positions. We've got fellow brothers and sisters in exile with us. What good are we if we're dead? They need our help. There's tons of excuses they could have come up with. And all those, those, these excuses, they seem quite sound and rational on face value. They're still in opposition to God's ways. To worship an alternative God, to worship an alternative God would violate God's command that we read there. They would know this in Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. They would be in violation of that. And they would also, if they were to fold, if they were to bow to these excuses and compromise their faith in God through their decision making, they would also eliminate any testimony that would point people to God's extraordinary power in their lives. But standing firm would show this nation just how relevant their God is, just how powerful and great their God is, superseding all other gods that Nebuchadnezzar could throw before you. And perhaps you relate to those excuses that I just mentioned there. Again, you put yourself in their shoes. Excuses that perhaps we could even relate to because we are tempted to compromise our faith, aren't we? And our convictions on a daily basis. They are there. Sometimes it's subtle. It might just come through in this form. Someone asks you, so, so tomorrow or, or next week, someone asks you, hey, Bob, Bill, Betty, whoever you are. Sorry if you're Bob, Bill or Betty, but I'm not meaning to pick on you. But what'd you do yesterday? What'd you get up to yesterday? You know, sometimes when we hear a very innocent and simple question like that, sometimes we get selective amnesia, don't we? Because our answer is of, sometimes is, there's a hidden truth in our answer. Instead of going to the place of, oh, I went to church. I actually got up early and went to church and heard this incredible sermon by Pastor Mark. It was on Daniel 3. I went to a small group. I hung out with a group of Christians. It was amazing. I went to an Easter presentation where 20 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ and I heard eight testimonies of these lives that have been turned upside down. Instead of answering that, what we often do is, oh, I went to the shops. I went to the cinema. Or, or I watched Celebrity Get Me Out of Here. Uh, I like to call, I'm not a celebrity, please keep me in here. It's a, um, it's a shocking show, I don't like that show. <laughs> but how often do we go to TV when we answer questions like that? Oh, I just watch television, just went, went to the movies. And so there's a partial truth in our answer, but it's not the whole truth. It's compromise. It's compromise, even in its simplistic form. Why do we compromise? Why do we do it? Well, it's quite simple. We do it to fit in. We do it so we avoid ridicule, to avoid exclusion, and because it's just easier. It's easier because we don't have to explain ourselves. We don't have to talk about Jesus. We don't have to try and draw someone into a relationship with Jesus through our testimony. It's just easier in many ways. But compromise takes us so far away from the heart of God and simply reinforces the secular norms and morals in our society. That, but by all counts, 
we are also adhering to. No difference, not at all set apart. I can think uh, many years ago, where I'd go along uh, annually on these hockey trips, I was fortunate to represent uh, Victoria in field hockey for years, for, as a junior right through into my adult years, and every year there'd be a two-week hockey trip to somewhere in Australia, and we'd be staying in a hotel room together as a team, or hotel rooms. And we'd congregate, we'd do things together on our... Uh, day, nights off and whatnot. And I remember this particular night walking into the room and the, the, the whole room gathered. We just had a team meeting and then it was time for some entertainment. And the coach organised this movie. I thought, fantastic, we're going to sit back and watch this movie. It was very clear to me that this was going to be a pornographic movie. What do I do with that? As a Christ follower, do I compromise? Look, no one will know. And I'm part of the team. You've got to do the team thing. You know, I can't walk out on the team and I might learn a couple of things and I might, uh, might see some things I haven't seen before, so it's intriguing at all. I can easily rationalise it. What do you do in that situation? Well, I didn't compromise. I walked out. I walked out and people noticed as I walked out. And you know what, as I walked out, as a Christian, I got teased big time. They're all having a go at me. Oh, you're weak, Percy, you're weak. Why can't you handle it? And there was a teasing and a ridicule that would go on for years and years because I was, I was confronted by such situations regularly on these hockey trips right through my teenage, young adult and adult years. And that teasing and ridicule continued and I'd cop it on the back of my Christian convictions on things like sex, alcohol, gambling and certainly foul language. I was different. I was different. In a sense, set apart. But to compromise my faith would bear no testimony to my life in Jesus Christ and bear no testimony to the greatness of who God is. To compromise my faith and just to blend in and fit in with them. And it would be dishonouring God in the process. And I'm sure many of you can relate to that example that I just used then or perhaps you can substitute it for some other context in your life. We all face those situations are you walking out or are you staying put? Set apart, different, happy to cop the ridicule, the teasing? You know what, those guys, a few of those guys that used to tease me year after year after year, years later came back and apologised to me and said, you know, Mark, we just want to apologise to teasing you for all those years about your, your strong convictions around sex, etc., etc." You know why we did it? Because we could see that you had something that we didn't. And we had an incredible conversation that then went forth from that moment. And that's often why people will tease you. Next one, confidence. I love these guys' confidence here. The God we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us. See, they believed in God's power to save them and they believed in his promises to be with them. They are relying on God. And when you rely on God, what happens is your faith becomes anchored. This reliance was strong, even if God would choose not to spare their lives. Have a look, listen to what they say. Even if he does not, we want you to know that we will not serve your gods or worship that image. Now, that is powerful. That is really, really powerful. Because what they're saying here is, even if things don't work out like we hope they will, we're not going to change our minds here. We die knowing we've not forsaken our God or compromised our faith. And that is huge. And so for us, even when we have no idea what the outcome of our courageous conviction will be, we can trust that God has us. He's got us in the palm of his hands and will not let us down, glorifying God regardless of the circumstances and the outcomes. That is the key. That is true discipleship. And their faith, for these guys, their faith in God was more important to them than even the fear of death. And sometimes, you know this, life can be downright tough. Life can be really, really scary. Perhaps you're in one of those situations now where you're facing your very own furnace. Uh, you're feeling the heat, the heat, of, uh, the heat in the workplace, or perhaps in a relationship, an abusive relationship that you're stuck in that's causing you heartache, or perhaps there's, there's grief, there's the furnace of finances in your life, and, and it all feels like doom and gloom, and there's no way out. Well, I want to say to you and hear this, stand firmly by your conviction. Stand firmly by what you know of God and who God is. Don't compromise your faith. Don't look for an easy way out, but have confidence that God sees you in your furnace and is there with you. He understands your pain. He understands your dilemma, 
and he will rescue you and deliver you in time. Hang in there. Hang in there because God is with you in the flames. You need to hear that. You're not there by yourself. God is with you in those flames just as he was for those three mates in that furnace. See, God never promised that we wouldn't experience difficult times. But he did promise that he'd be there with us as we go through them. And Isaiah 43, 2 is a great example of that. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. They won't set you ablaze. And even when the flames in your life are hot, even when the flames in your life are really intense, God can keep you safe. God will give you strength to stand firm. And it's the sort of strength that comes from a deep, abiding, invested relationship with God, our Father in heaven. It won't come through a shallow faith. It won't come through a ho-hum faith. It'll come from a deeply invested faith. That's where you'll draw your strength. That's where you'll draw your courage. What's the fourth one? Camaraderie. Now, I looked up the definition of camaraderie, and it's this. It's a feeling of trust and friendship among a group of people who have usually done life together for some period of time. And that's what we see in these three guys, hey? What's noticeable here is that these three friends are in this together, supporting each other, making decisions together. They're in the furnace together, and they're modeling incredible friendship. I'm not sure how long they've known each other. Obviously, for the three years that they they were educated together. They may well have known each other before they were 15-year-olds too. I don't know. But there's obviously a deep bond between them. Great, solid friendship. And that reminds us that faith ought not be a lonely and isolated journey. We need fellow brothers. We need fellow sisters in Christ alongside us in the cut and thrust of life. We are better together. Make no mistake, we're better together and we're stronger together. That's why in the context of Crossway, we often talk about the importance of being in a life group. It's not just for the sake of numbers, it's for the sake of your life. Get together in a life group where you can support one another, pray for each other, champion each other, be there for each other during those really important times in your life. To laugh together, to eat together, to have fun together. For all of those reasons, to have a mentor in your life that can speak truth at times when you need to hear that truth that no one else will speak for you. Mentors are really important. You see, there is strength in relationship. Very, very important. It's where iron sharpens iron. It's where wisdom can be shared. It's where prayers can be received. It's where practical and emotional and spiritual support can be garnered when you're in those relationships. We need each other. We need each other in our faith journey. And God knows that. Don't fight your flames alone. Fight them with people right alongside of you because you can share your struggles. It's important not to fight those flames by yourself, particularly those of you who are going through a really tough time right now. Perhaps some of you might even be struggling with some, some element of mental illness. Can I encourage you, speak up. It's not a place of weakness to speak up. It's actually a place of, a place of strength to speak up. Share your struggle with someone. Ask for help. Invite people into your dilemma. Because God uses our relationships. He uses the people around us to further grow us and strengthen our lives. Okay, so what was the outcome of all of this? For these three, the king was absolutely furious. He's absolutely furious. Can't believe these guys would treat him with such disdain. So furious, he orders the furnace to be heated up seven times stronger than usual. There would be no escape. So hot were the flames that the soldiers that threw the three guys into the furnace died themselves. How's that for a job? Man. But something amazing happened. Something amazing. When the king looked into the furnace, he sees these three men who had been bound and tied up, unbound, walking around the flames and through the flames, with no apparent discomfort. It was incredible. And in addition, he sees a fourth man, which Nebuchadnezzar thinks he recognizes as a, a man or a son of a God. Now, the fourth person was obviously supernatural. Now, whether that was an angel, but God sends some sort of heavenly visitor to accompany these guys in their time of trial and in their time of need. The king then calls them out of the fire. 
as you do. That, that he calls them out, they come out of the furnace, they're unharmed, not a hair on their head has been singed, their clothes have not been scorched, they don't even smell of smoke. You know what it's like when you're around a bonfire, you can be 20 metres from a bonfire and go home and it smells like you've smoked a whole packet of cigarettes. These guys don't even smell. It is amazing. This miracle that God has orchestrated in that furnace and his incredible power is really evident here and the king is absolutely astonished. And in that moment, he acknowledges God's greatness. And he even promotes these three guys, his friends, to greater responsibilities and higher positions in the province. They are rewarded for their firm and unshakable faith. You see, when we make a stand, this is really important for us, when we make a stand for God, when we hold firmly to our convictions, our Christ-like convictions, and we disregard, we push compromise to the side, and we exercise a confidence in God, and doing so often together, people notice. Your life will bear incredible testimony. Lives will be impacted through your example. Make no mistake. The, see, the king watched and the king was moved. He didn't just promote them to higher positions. He acknowledged and considered that their God was the one true God through their testimony. But what about Daniel? Just as we come to a conclusion, because here we are talking about the book of Daniel, and Daniel's a central figure in it all, and we haven't even really mentioned Daniel tonight, have we? So let me just quickly mention him. Where is he? Where is he in chapter 3? He's strangely silent through this whole narrative. So we're not, really sure, we're not really sure what's going on here with Daniel. Did he blend in during this period of time? Did, was he bowing down? Uh, did he say anything to anyone at the time? What was going on? He must have known what was going on, but Scripture doesn't mention him at all through this whole chapter. But what we can assume is that he watched. He watched what the guys did, or at least heard what they did. And just like the king, we can assume that his friends had a massive Massive impact on him. Why? Just flip three chapters ahead. You get to Daniel chapter 6. And you see that a, a similar decree has been issued by the then king, King Darius. That everyone in the kingdom is to pray only to King Darius. Otherwise, they wouldn't be thrown into a fiery furnace. They'd be thrown into the lion's den. Pretty similar, hey? And what do we see in Daniel in that moment? A refusal to do so. A refusal to bow down and, and pray to King Darius. Instead, he would go home rush home, go upstairs, open up the window so people could see him in full view, and three times a day he would pray and give thanks to his God. Consistent with the same conviction his three friends had courageously exhibited some time earlier. That we do know. They must have had an impact on his life. See, when you stand firm in your convictions, when you stay true to your faith, people watch, people notice, they're watching to see how we respond to the furnace of life. So we're going to come into a time of prayer in a moment. But if you're going through a fiery trial right now, if your faith is being tested, if you're being tempted to compromise and just set your Christ-like convictions to the side out of convenience, stand firm. Hold on to your convictions. Hold on to what you know of God. Hold on to them courageously. Stand firm and don't waver and trust that God will bring you through. It may not be easy. It may not happen tomorrow. But remember, just like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, you are not alone in the fire. God is right there with you. He's supporting you. He's protecting you. He's walking with you. He's in the flames with you. So don't lose hope as you face that furnace in your life, even now, or the furnaces that will come throughout your life. God is with you. Amen? God is always with us. And your testimony, may your testimony impact the lives of those who are watching on. Let's pray together. For those of you online, would you join us in prayer? And let's have a moment just to be quiet and still our hearts before the Lord. And perhaps in your life right now, there is a furnace that you feel that you're in the midst of. There's a struggle. You feel like the flames are licking all around you. You're being singed. You're being burnt. Or you feel like you're about to be. Perhaps there's a temptation to compromise and just to fit in, to avoid that ridicule and exclusion. It's me 
easier that way. What's going on in your life right now that you need to put before your God, our God in heaven, who's worthy of our praise and worthy of our honour and worthy of our wise and godly choices? Whatever that furnace might be for you, just name it. And God, as we do so, we ask that you might walk with us in those flames. You might protect us and support us, that we wouldn't cower in a corner in fear, that we would have the belief that you can bring us through and rescue us, just like you rescued these three guys. And we know there's a spiritual battle going on over the choices that we make, the God of Israel versus those gods of Nebuchadnezzar, representing the evil in our world. May we not bow down to that evil, but rather bow down to you, our great God, who is worthy of our praise. And may our lives bear testimony to your power, to your greatness. So God, we ask that you might help us, you might rescue us in our time of the and infuse within each of us a courage and a strength that only you can supply in these times that seem and feel insurmountable. Come Holy Spirit, wash over us and endow us with that courageous conviction that we might step forward with a genuine confidence in you. And we wanna thank you for the ultimate victory over the eternal flames and that furnace that is referred to in the Gospels in the New Testament, highlighting that separation, that eternal separation from you. Thank you, Jesus, that you won victory over all of that through what you've done for us on the cross and that incredible triumphant resurrection that we can share in that victory over those flames and never be separated from you, never have to worry about those flames, that eternal furnace. We get to have eternity with you. And for that, we are grateful. And we are grateful that we can share in that victory, that ultimate victory, and those little victories we can have in this life as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, how about we stand, let's sing in victory as we go.
message from Pastor Mark. You know, you can live that life with confidence, no matter what is in front of you, uh, like they were in that fiery furnace. The, the, the circumstances in front of them would have been overwhelming, but they could have approached it with confidence that God was going to come through for them. Uh, they, they approached it with camaraderie as well, in community. Um, no one had to go through that alone. And we want you to know here at Crossway that you don't have to go through life alone. There's community here for you that would love to rally around you. One of the ways that we can do that is by praying for you. Maybe that your situation in your life is bigger than you can possibly imagine, like that fiery furnace. We would love to pray for you. We would love to pray that God will move in your life just as he did in that situation. So the offer is open to you. We'll pop a link into the chat uh, on Facebook and on YouTube where you can get prayer straight away. Uh, those prayer requests go to me and my team. We'd love to pray for you. Uh, if you're on our church website, you can literally hit the request prayer button and one of our team will pray with you right on the spot. But don't leave it. You know, I know, I get your messages every week. Some of you are dealing with really tough circumstances. That fiery furnace is right in front of you and you need prayer. Only God can change the outcome. So go ahead, share uh, with each other in the chat. If you, want, if you need prayer in the chat, you can go into the chat or you can click on those links. We would love to pray for you. Really, really important. Maybe after this service now, you've gone, whoa, I know someone that needs this message. I know someone that needs to hear it. Uh, so go ahead and share that with your friends and your family. If you're on Facebook or YouTube, or on church website, there are opportunities to share. Again, you can do it via text message, through uh, Facebook messages, through WhatsApp. Go ahead and be brave, because you never know what God will do with such a powerful message of hope and perseverance, community, with what Mark spoke about today. So that's about it for today's service. I hope you have an incredible week. And again, that offer is out there if you want to join our Facebook community, uh, just like it was at the start of the service. Uh, for the rest of you, God bless you. Have a great 